Uh, I think it's very exciting uh, that uh, we're here at the web, but it's even more exciting that we're right after the Israeli panel because uh, the, the problem is very different for our, for our region. Um, I think uh, Israel was very good at marketing itself and uh, creating great startups, so has lots of credibility in this field. The Arab region, I mean, I don't know what you think when we tell you Arab region, but I'd say you'd go for uh, revolution, lack of women rights, um, extremism, poverty, oil, rich Arabs, something like that, rather than and um, I think we have great people on this panel to convince you that now, from now on, you should be thinking innovation, entrepreneurship, technology, high energy, young people that really want to change the world. Uh, so my name is Hava and I chair the uh, MIT Enterprise Forum of the Pan Arab Region. It's an initiative by MIT to promote entrepreneurship around the world and I chair the Arab chapter. Uh, for that. And um, I'm uh, very happy to have this panel with me and I will start before uh, asking them some questions by breaking some of the uh, cliches we have in this region by sharing with you a few statistics. So the, um, the MIT Enterprise Forum of the Pan Arab region organizes every year the MIT Startup Competition and we receive over 5,000 teams from the Arab region every year. So there are plenty of entrepreneurs in this region. 50% of these teams have uh, women on them or are women-led teams. So many women entrepreneurs in this region. Uh, did you know that Saudi Arabia is the first user of YouTube um, in the world? And the fourth thing, just to continue breaking the cliches, Dubai and many other countries in the region has the number one penetration of smartphones. So I think we have an incredible market for these great entrepreneurs to flourish. And I will start with uh, another woman, Hinda Freya, who's a winner of uh, our MIT competition. And uh, she has some very smart wearables. Uh, she's a swimmer. And she realized that uh, while runners have lots of information on very smart watches telling them how fast they run and uh, their heart rate, etc. Nothing is done for swimmers. So, Hind has created very smart goggles. And uh, my first question to Hind is, um, you know, how do you see, how do you get into this field? How do you see the wearables market going forward? Uh, and smart uh, wearables that are connected. Uh, how do you see that? Yeah, um, so the idea really came from a personal need. And at that time, there's still, it was in 2010, the word wearables was not in yet. I think it wasn't created yet for technology. And uh, it really happened at the same time. So I was thinking about a monitor that uh, I, I needed for my swimming trainings. And at the same time, there was all of these gadgets, all of these wearables being created to monitor different aspects of one's daily life. So think Fitbit, think Nike Fuel Band. So all of those were coming up. And um, since then, since 2010, in only three years, wearables have shifted completely because they switch from the runner's watches that are huge and bulky and require a chest strap to things that are really small that you cannot see, to things that are pretty, to things that you want to show and that you want to wear rather than only wearing during your training. And so uh, it has shifted completely and we have been riding the wave to make something beautiful and small and sleek uh, that gives you uh, valuable data that you can incorporate in your daily habits and that leads you to a healthier, uh, more fit lifestyle. Great. Um, so now I, I will move to our next entrepreneur, Kaswara, who has the uh, first online entertainment channel in uh, Saudi Arabia. He started U-Turn. Um, and um, uh, actually, I'll share with you some thoughts we had before coming on stage. Kaswara was wondering if he should be wearing a uh, Saudi uh, traditional uh, costume as opposed to what he's wearing today. And uh, the, there was actually a split uh, jury on this. I was uh, for him to be dressed as he is now, so I guess I won. Uh, but many people were telling me you, you'd break even more the cliche if you come with your uh, national costume, because um, 
it, it really shows that the entrepreneurship spirit has really no boundaries. So we have boundaries into our mind when we see someone different, but entrepreneurship and the spirit of entrepreneurship has, is really universal. So my first question to Kaswara, you know, you started an online entertainment channel in Saudi Arabia, I mean, of all places, it's probably the one where you would least think of starting a media company uh, with all the censorship and the image we have of communication and information in Saudi Arabia. So how did you get there? Uh, it was basically the need. Uh, if anybody knows Saudi Arabia very well, media is not, you know, we don't have a lot of local content, premium content. We have the uh, Saudi official TV channels, which is not watched by most of the people. It's watched by only a few because, it, you know, the content in there does not really talk to all Saudis. And then you've got other satellite channels that are Saudi owned, but the content is regional. So nobody was really focusing on the Saudi market, on the Saudi youth to talk to them, to reach them, to give them content that they really want. I mean, we as, as users, we were getting the content we wanted. So all what happened is we started creating content from us to us, sort of, from the youth to the youth. So the content that came was pure Saudi that talks to the average everyday Saudi that you see. Uh, it was daring, it was provocative. I mean, I remember the first one, we, the first show we started, it was a political satire, something like John Stewart. And, uh, and, and we put it on, you know, online and we thought, you know, we're going to get 20, 30,000, it would be great if we do that. I think the first one got around 40,000. Second, uh, you know, episode got around 100 and something. By the third one, we were a million. So we're like, you know, this was a phenomenon. We, we ourselves don't believe or understand how this happened so fast. But in the end, it was really the need for content, pure Saudi content that talks to everybody in Saudi, at least the youth, uh, from a youth perspective. So, from the youth to the youth, and I forgot to say that it has over 10 million viewers now on, uh, on U-Turn. Um, I will move to uh, Eli, uh, Eli from Lebanon, who started um, a, an online music company called Anrami. Uh, that has already uh, 4 million uh, subscribers today. Uh, am I right? Yeah? Yeah, just a bit over that. A bit over that. And um, so today, you know, you have uh, Spotify, Deezer, Google Play, and so many players. So, um, and you're from, you have this liability of being from this uh, wonderful region. So how do you compete, Eli? Well, so far, I'm happy to say we're competing pretty well. We have even iTunes uh, in the region, but I think we're not really competing with those that you just mentioned. We're mostly competing with piracy. We're competing maybe with YouTube too, but the rest we're working together somehow because we're just trying to make uh, music, the legal music, uh, be more uh, democratic, available in the region. Again, it all started, as everybody's mentioning, as of need. We, I used to travel, I used to realize that if I travel, I can use a service that allows me to listen to anything I want in my pocket. I can have millions of songs. But when I come back home, and in the region, we have nothing. I mean, piracy is dominant simply because that the user doesn't have an alternative. So we came up with the idea and we say, yeah, I mean, it's probably one of the hardest things to do is doing a music service. Uh, but first we realized that the mobile penetration in the region and the smartphone penetration is actually up the roof. We are, uh, the, the growth still in the region is year on year 37%. And uh, we, we have some countries that with 75% mobile penetration like Qatar or UAE 72%. So we saw that as an opportunity. We launched a mobile music service that is mobile only for now. And we, we Estimated that by the end of the first year, we're going to have 200,000 users, 300,000 users. Then now we're over 4 million simply because we're meeting a need and the users want to use our service. How do we compete? We really offer uh, different content. First, we're digitizing Arabic content that was never actually digitized. I mean, it was never in a form of CDs, never available online, never available in many of the services you mentioned. Uh, and this actually creates value for people who are in the region uh, want to listen to those Arabic songs or outside the region. So we actually have 25% of our users outside the Arab world. In the Arab world, we even try to remodel the, the business. 
So we started by looking at what Deezer, Spotify, and others were doing, and we said we don't want to do this because they're not generating profits so far, and they're actually raising millions or hundreds of millions of dollars. We couldn't do that. I mean, at first it was hard raising money for a business like ours. Now it's okay, it's, it's easier, not easy, but easier. Uh, we realized that we really need to tell everybody, the stakeholders, that if you want to work in the Middle East, you want to put legal music, you have to do things differently. And they all agreed. That's why we have Lady Gaga tweeting about Angami like last week. And uh, we have a total support for launching plans uh, in the next weeks with the several mobile operators. Right now we are at eight mobile operators. And we're launching plans unheard of. I can't right now disclose them, but it's quite unheard of and totally anywhere in the, uh, the world. We're uh, launching a new feature with Google today in the afternoon. I mean, clearly they're realizing that at least there's traction, there's need, there are users, and we're satisfying that. So if even Lady Gaga is tweeting about Anjami, I suggest you download it and, and see uh, what it is Thank about. Thank you for that. Uh, we have another uh, a natural born entrepreneur, uh, really Ahmad Al Khatib here with us. Um, it's um, uh, quite an interesting story. Ahmad has uh, lots of experience in the U.S. with uh, Amazon, eBay, Zazzle, and he came back to the region to start a company called Marca VIP. Um, since we're in France, it's a bit the uh, vente privé of the Middle East. Um, and um, my question for you is: you know, you came back after all this experience in the uh, in the U.S. So, what what did you find was different in the in the MENA region? And uh, if you were to do it again, would you do it again? Thank you, Hannah. Yeah, absolutely. I'll start by answering the, the, the latter question. I would do it all over again anytime. Uh, it's been really an exciting journey uh, moving from uh, Silicon Valley to the Middle East. Um, at the end of 2009, as you know, the economic downturn was taking place in the States. And I wanted to look uh, for, for new and exciting opportunities after having spent um, so much time in, in, in e e-commerce companies, specifically in early stage startups. Uh, and when I came to the Middle East, uh, uh, there was some e-commerce activity going on, but nothing nothing uh, uh, to speak of. Um, and it reminded me really of, of the States back in 1996, uh, when e-commerce companies started sprinting up everywhere. Uh, uh, and so what's going on right now really is, is an e-commerce revolution. Uh, the Middle East has some of the uh, 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 largest appetite for online shopping uh, in the world. In fact, according to Visa, it's the fastest growing e-commerce market year over year with a 45% uh, increase. Um, the other thing is that the average basket size that we're seeing, for example, in some of the countries is reaching up to $175, which is a lot, much, much more than what you see in Europe, for example, uh, or, or the States. So people um, are converting to online. There's a, an exodus that's taking place uh, in, in countries like Saudi Arabia, in, in countries like the United Arab Emirates, and even in, uh, in Lebanon and Jordan. So I'm seeing the same exact movie all over again, uh, the one that I saw in the Valley from 96 to 2000, taking place in the Middle East uh, right now. However, there's a lot of different challenges and problems that are facing this market, uh, which are very different from what e-commerce companies have faced early on in, in the States. For example, you have uh, the payment issue. A lot of uh, people prefer to use the cash on delivery method. Uh, in fact, at Marca VIP today, 85% of our payments happen uh, on a cash on delivery basis. When we actually go and deliver the product to the customer, this is when we collect the cash uh, for that order. There's also a cross-border transportation issue. So shipping something from the United Arab Emirates, from Dubai to Saudi Arabia, sometimes is more expensive than shipping it from Dubai to the United States. Uh, and that's because the logistics companies in the region are not optimized for the e-commerce model. They're not optimized for, for the, the convenience model. In the States or in Europe, you can ship anything overnight, uh, 24 hours, for less than two euros uh, per kilo, let's say. Uh, for us, uh, for some of the companies in, in the Middle East that are trying uh, to, to start up, it costs them upwards of $30 per order. So it really eats a lot out of your margin. So we had to come up with a lot of innovative solutions uh, to be able to uh, uh, deliver and, and at the same time uh, make money. So today, Marca VIP, for example, 
delivers over 50% of its orders using its own last mile delivery service. We actually have our own cars and drivers on the ground in uh, three countries right now, and very soon in Saudi Arabia, which is, uh, uh, by the way, our largest market that represents 40% of our business. Uh, but also the geography is, is, uh, is so different. Uh, uh, you know, cities are very spread apart. Uh, so being able to even have your own logistics fleet is, is still a massive challenge. However, the opportunity is huge. Uh, as I mentioned, the appetite for buying products online is massive. This is because uh, people are now uh, starting to see the benefits of shopping online, uh, getting the products cheaper, uh, getting product reviews, uh, having to see uh, how the product uh, uh, performed, for example, in, in, uh, with, with, with other users. So you're really seeing a lot of people uh, becoming very interested in this. And uh, Marca VIP is in a very unique position to capture that market today. And we're very happy about what we've, uh, we've accomplished.